and ends questions to the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister. Order members, we now move to questions to the Employment and Learning Minister. And I call Paul Maskey. Mr. Maskey. Paul Maskey, I can't call your case to every hand. Question number one, please. Um, it is my understanding that the Strategic Investment Board engaged with Mary's and facilitated the work carried out by the PA Consulting Group, which resulted in the report published in December of 2010. At that stage, my department acknowledged the report as it was not appropriate for it to comment, given that it had not been formally adopted by the College's governing body. The report made several assumptions about uh, required uh, future student numbers and brought forward a number of proposals to reduce costs, diversify and increase income to ensure the sustainability of the College. The College is working in a challenging environment and I welcome the comprehensive nature of this analysis. This has informed the production of the institutional plan which was agreed by the governing body of the College in June of 2011. I believe that the institutional plan will be published by the College at some point in the future, and I and my officials are engaging with the College on its future sustainability, building on the recent meetings that I have had with members of the governing body and also senior management at the College. Just with regards to that, I would be grateful because uh, St Mary's is a, what I think is a very linchpin of the education studies within West Belfast, and I think it's great. And I'm just wondering if the Minister could state if he is committed to supporting the sustainability of St Mary's University College as an autonomous um, institution for further education, and would he consider increasing the allocation of liberal arts, arts students to the university? Um, I thank uh, Mr Maskey for a supplementary. Um, I'm certainly very conscious of the, the importance that it is placed in St Mary's in the context of the, of the West Belfast. Um, constituency, and uh, as a member will be aware, that there, there are a number of issues um, pertaining to the future of teacher training um, within Northern Ireland, and, and I'm giving act active consideration to all of those. Um, and many have been raised by members in this house, and indeed there are other aspects um, to, to it as well. Um, I'm meeting with a number of stakeholder groups, and indeed I'm, I'm meeting Mr. Maskey and his colleague um, Sue Ramsey, along with the principal, um, once again of St Mary's in the very near future, and I, I look forward to that engagement. Mr. Anderson, supplementary. Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, does he regard the, the report on St Mary's College as having any bearing on the proposed merger of Stamilis uh, College and Queen's University? Uh, again, I thank Mr. Anderson for um, his question. Um, the House will appreciate um, that there is uh, an outstanding issue um, in relation to the, the merger of Strand Millis and Queen's University, um, which was the subject of consultation uh, by my department. Um, I'm certainly cur currently considering the way forward on that alongside a number of re uh, related policy issues in terms of the wider framework in terms of, of, teacher, of teacher training as relates to my department. And uh, I look forward to bringing uh, some proposals to the House in the very near future in that regard. McDevitt for supplementary. Mr McDevitt. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, I wonder, uh, has the Minister for Employment and Learning reflected on the viability audit process which his colleague, the Minister for Education, is undertaking at the moment, and where he thinks such a process would indeed be very useful for higher education institutions here in Northern Ireland? Um, well, I certainly assure Mr McDevitt I, I reflect on, on, on many issues, and uh, there is much to reflect upon in, in terms of, of, of Northern Ireland. Um, Certainly, in terms of looking at viability, in terms of our higher education institutions, we, ha we have many, um, not just in terms of two universities, uh, also teacher training uh, colleges, and indeed our further education colleges are also higher education institutions as, as well. Um, I, certainly, my immediate focus is ensuring that, that the teacher training system in Northern Ireland is, is sustainable for, for the future, and that is uh, the, the priority at this stage. The rest of the, the, the institutions are certainly uh, all, all very viable and playing a, a, a fundamental role in terms of the uh, future investment in the economy of Northern Ireland. Jim Allister, Mr. Allister. Uh, does the Minister accept that St Mary's devotion to its own distinct Catholic ethos and its determination to stay without outside any merger proposals in the higher education sector is something which is working adversely to the interests of St Millis, who find themselves the object of the pressure for merger from which uh, St Mary's appears to be exempt? I, again, I thank Mr Alistair uh, for the question. I think it is important that we are all conscious of the, the differences in terms of the approaches made by Strand Millis and St Mary's, both of which are autonomous bodies. Um, the Board of Governors of Strand Millis ha have unanimously requested uh, the merger with Queen's University. The current position of St Mary's um, is to remain a, a separate body. However, um, I, 
at, at the risk of repeating myself, I am minded of the, the wider dimensions uh, relating um, to the policy um, on teacher training, and uh, I'm giving active consideration to a whole range um, of, of issues. And uh, I would certainly urge the House um, to be patient in that regard, uh, and uh, I should be back in the very near future uh, to set out what I believe is the way forward in this regard. Thanks. On the list for the question, Mervyn Story. Mr. Story. Question number two, Mr. Speaker. Um, I have not met with the Minister of Education in relation to the Balamoney Learning Community proposal to create a, six, uh, a shared sixth form. However, I do meet the Minister for Education on a regular basis uh, to consider a number of issues of mutual interest. At our latest meeting on the 5th of October, we discussed the role that both departments have to play in the provision of a broad and balanced choice of courses for 14 to 19 year olds to meet their needs, interests, and career aspirations. For school pupils, this can be delivered through collaboration between schools, FE colleges and training providers under the entitlement framework. This provides the flexibility to offer pupils a focused curriculum and is about schools and colleges putting the needs of young people at the core of their thinking. Further education colleges can offer schools access to high quality applied courses deliver delivered in the state of the art facilities and led by industry experts, things that schools cannot normally provide. Both departments are committed to ensuring that every young person has the opportunity through the education and training system to fulfil their potential. Linked with this is a need to develop a highly skilled, flexible and innovative workforce which will contribute to the twin goals of economic success and social inclusion. Both departments recognise that better value for money and an enriched educational experience can be achieved through reduced duplication and the best use of existing resources in the schools for their education and training systems. Consequently, further education colleges are, are actively involved with area learning communities in the strategic planning of local education provision. Therefore, the, the Northern Regional College will be keen to work alongside and add value to whatever sixth form school structure emerges in the Ballymoney area. Mr. Story. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy, or Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. But what he share my concern that the process that we have been engaged in for some period of time in relation to trying to formulate a common sixth form in the Balamoney area it can lead to a, a still a duplication of provision, both in the Coleraine Rain campus of the Northern Regional College and also in the Balamoney campus. And given the concerns there are in relation to the future of the Balamoney campus vis-à-vis uh, -a, -vis a, a new capital build, will he give an assurance to this House that students will be offered the best po possible uh, menu of courses and not to the disadvantage of any particular school in the area? Um, I thank Mr Story for his supplementary. Certainly, I am uh, extremely committed to uh, avoiding duplication in terms of, of, of public expenditure. Um, and I, I, think, I think it's also important that we do stress that the ultimate importance in all of this is the experience for uh, the student and ensuring that they have uh, the full access um, to the, the range of choices uh, that are out there uh, without any barriers being put um, in, in, in their place. Um, certainly, I'm conscious about the, the concerns that have been raised regarding the future of the Ballymoney campus. And I, I've certainly made clear that um, I'm not um, in the business of taking any individual decisions uh, in relation uh, to rationalisation uh, outside the context of the outlined business case. And that's what I'm currently uh, seeking from at Northern Regional College. And uh, indeed, um, that will still be some, some time away. Margaret Cancorlia, would the Minister agree with me on the importance of ensuring we have post-16 pathways for our young people who are currently not in education, employment or training, and what actions has he taken to ensure that young people do have uh, those possibilities? Um, I thank uh, Katrina Rowan for um, her, her, her supplementary. Uh, I think it's important that we do reflect on a whole range of interventions that are, are necessary. We've already mentioned the entitlement framework, um, which um, relates more to the more of the formal education system. Um, at, at present, my department is working in conjunction with the Department of Education uh, over the 14 to 19 uh, framework, and uh, I certainly hope that we'll be in a position to, to announce the, at least the, the, the high-level principles in relation to that in, in the very near future. Uh, my department also leads on behalf of the executive in, in relation to NEETS. And, uh, as the member will be aware, we have had a comprehensive uh, consultation on that in, in recent months. And indeed, the Employment and Learning Committee did a, 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 an investigation into that. And we will be bringing forward uh, formal proposals on that strategy to the executive in the very near future, probably in early, early 2012. Next on the list, Anna Lowe. Question number three, Mr Speaker. Uh, I am strongly committed to the creation of a shared and integrated society in Northern Ireland. 
Every minister has a duty to promote a shared future, both individually and through collective action by the executive. I am currently in discussions with officials within my department with a view to the creation of a form of shared future policy proofing. In addition to current forms of policy proofing, this mechanism would be applied to all future departmental policies to assess if they positively contribute to a shared society or inadvertently reinforce divisions or provide services on a segregated basis. Those policies that tend towards separation will be avoided, while those that are neutral or, that, or which possibly advance the shared future will be favoured. This policy tool will be broader than the current good relations aspect of equality proofing. I believe that these changes would represent a groundbreaking development in terms of the policy making process and demonstrate a solid commitment to a shared future by my department and hopefully an example to others. For supplementary. Thank you. I uh, thank the Minister for his uh, very positive response to my question and I certainly congratulate him, him on developing uh, such a good, uh, good relations policy. Can I ask the Minister what sort of issues or problems his department and maybe unemployed people face um, in, in, um, in relation to promoting a shared future? Um, I, I thank uh, Anna Lowe for her question and indeed her, her welcome for um, that, that announcement that, that, that I've made. Uh, I think um, shared future issues and, and the, the consequences of divisions can affect uh, all of our departments in a whole range of areas. In terms of my own, there are a number that, that spring to mind. We have already mentioned the, the issue of teacher training um, during this session to, to, to begin with. Uh, there's also issues in terms of some distortions in terms of how we provide uh, support to those out, outside um, of, of employment uh, in terms of some duplication of services and indeed some of our uh, facilities may be in effect geared towards one or other section of the, of the community, uh, not by um, design but in terms of how uh, use is actually developed um, over time and we need to be mindful of that in terms of how we develop uh, future work programmes. Another area that I'm particularly interested in is, is trying to address the issue of labour mobility in Northern Ireland. Uh, we do have a, a problem uh, in a very general sense in terms of how far people are prepared to go in terms of accessing uh, work opportunities, but I also believe that there is a, an aspect of that that is linked to divisions on, on the ground and that there's evidence that some people are unwilling to move out of certain areas into other, on, into other areas for work. Uh, that's a lost opportunity to the economy as a whole, but also impacts upon their own individual opportunities, and I, I think that's something we, we do need to tackle. Call me for Mr. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the minister what steps he thinks he can take to help promote uh, applications to McGee University from uh, students from the Protestant backgrounds? Well, I thank Mr Eastwood for um, that, that comment. I think it's important that we, we, we take the opportunity to stress uh, that all of our universities are, are open um, to, to all sections um, of, of the community, and that um, both the University of Ulster and Queen's uh, are committed to tackling any chill factors, whether they are actual or whether they are perceived uh, ch chill factors. Uh, I believe that we do have neutral environments uh, in all of those universities. There may well be wider issues in terms of, of society that we have to, to address to encourage um, a, a wider balance um, of, of applications. But it's also important that we, al we also interrogate the data in terms of those actually coming forward uh, for higher education. And indeed, the notion that we do have uh, a skewing in terms of where people uh, go in terms of the tradition that they come from uh, to one or other place, I think in, in many respects, um, senses is actually uh, misunderstood and significantly exaggerated. Mr. Malloy, for some of the Thank you, thank you Minister, for your replies. In relation to the shared future, and, and mindful of the exhibition that we had of the Food Education Colleges upstairs today, uh, can he actually guarantee that the resources will actually be right across the community to ensure that the Food Education Colleges can deliver west of the ban? Um, I thank Mr Malloy for, for that question and certainly I am very happy to give the House that, um, uh, an assurance that I am uh, co wholly committed uh, to ensuring that we spend our resources uh, on a fair and equitable basis. And I think what I have said applies to all of the members of the Executive and is very much part uh, of the pledge of office uh, that we take and indeed also part of, of the Ministerial Code. Uh, Mr Malloy raised the issue of the, the, the showcase of further education and maybe um, it gives me the opportunity actually to, to highlight and celebrate uh, the real achievement 
achievement that we have in our further education system in terms of how they are supporting uh, business and actually taking forward a lot of, of quality innovation. And indeed, it's also worth highlighting that in terms of, of world skills, uh, we had a number of people from Northern Ireland um, who w went on and achieved world, world standards. Indeed, we have, we have the, the world champion the gold medalist in terms of bricklaying uh, coming from, uh, from Northern Ireland. Uh, and also, we, we have other uh, medalists. And this is a real a testament to the real strength and depth that we have in terms of our young people and indeed the investment of further education in terms of those vocational type of, of training. Danny Kenham for supplementary. Mr Kenham. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. May I thank the Minister for his answer. I think there was a great deal in your initial answer that I look forward to hearing more about. Um, but which approach to the shared future does, or do you, does the Minister favour integration or sharing of resources? Um, I thank Mr Kenham for his, his question. I don't, I don't see sharing and integration as being uh, po polar opposites. Uh, I think they are very much part of a continuum of things that we, that we can do. Um, any movement in the direction of sharing um, is to be beneficial. In many respects, uh, the, the much more integrated approach um, is, is, is more beneficial socially, economically and uh, financially. Uh, but also, we have a lot to gain in terms of, of other ranges of sharing models that may fall short of integration. Next on the list, Sam Gardner. Mr. Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number four. The Essential Skills for Living strategy, launched in 2002, has been effective in a number of ways in addressing the literacy, numeracy, and ICT needs of adults within Northern Ireland. To date, over 71,600 individuals have achieved over 128,500 qualifications in the Essential Skills of Literacy, Numeracy, and ICT. This has provided learners with the skills they need to progress at home and at work. In addition, the strategy is successfully targeting hard, harder to reach adults, with 31% of enrolments coming from the most deprived wards in Northern Ireland. Given the harder to reach cohort that the programme targets, it is particularly gratifying that the retention and achievement rates for essential skills are 90% and 69% respectively. This compares very, very favourably with performance in other further education courses on offer. Recent research by Oxford Economics has concluded that progress on adult literacy and numeracy within Northern Ireland is performing very uh, well in comparison to our counterparts in England, Scotland and Wales. Significantly, the cost per qualification has reduced progressively from around £900 in 2004 to 5 to just over £350 in 2010-11. I recognise the importance of addressing the essential skills needs of older learners and it is encouraging to note that the numbers, numbers of those aged over 25 who enrol on the essential skills provision continues to increase. My department has worked closely with the Northern Ireland Digital Hub and with broadcasters to support campaigns aimed at older learners. Also, I met recently with the Acting Older People's Commissioner to consider effective ways to reach older people who do not normally engage with any arm of government or learning provision. My department will continue to monitor the participation of older learners on this important provision. Therefore, while more remains to be done, the Essential Skills Strategy has been a success story in Northern Ireland. Mr. Gardner, for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I thank the, the Minister very much for his very in-depth uh, answer. Could I ask him what common ground exists between literacy and numeracy problems in schools and in the adult population, and what is being done to bring the respective actions, action plans together? Well, again, this is um, an, an area that cuts across um, two uh, dif different departments, and I, I imagine that the Minister for Education would be much better placed to, to address the, the sentiments uh, raised by Mr Gardner um, th than myself, though it's, it is, of course, important to recognise that um, the actions and the, the interventions that we have in terms of primary and secondary education uh, go a, a very long way to shaping uh, the environment that uh, my department uh, will in, in turn address with those over, over 16 uh, year, years old. I think it's also important that we, that we stress that uh, investment in essential skills is actually critically important uh, to our, our economy. Um, in this increasingly competitive um, age, it's important that we invest in skills right across the very broad spectrum. And where people are being left out of the labour market uh, through uh, an absence of essential skills, that's a loss uh, to our economy, as well as being a, a, a loss of opportunity to the individuals concerned. Dominic Bradley. Mr Bradley. I was showing my kist air 
Um, could the Minister say how training organisations in the region who promote skill-based learning have been affected by the recession and what knock-on effect this has had on learners? Thank you. Um, well, I think it's important to stress that the commitments of my department uh, to funding of essential skills um, r remain. It uh, is something that is a, a priority uh, f for myself. I, I don't um, think that the demand context that we are facing is going to be overly affected by the, a recession or uh, the lack of a recession. This is something that has uh, much more deeper historical roots within, within our society. Uh, and indeed, it, 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 this will be a priority for my department, whether uh, we're in the current economic situation and indeed into the future as our economy uh, begins to improve and to grow. For question. John Dallet. Mr. Dallet. To speaker, question number five. The uh, Labour Relations a Agency operates a helpline service answering queries from the public about employment rights and responsibilities, including those of temporary workers. It also offers conciliation in workplace disputes, which could form or already have formed the basis for a complaint to an industrial tribunal or the Fair Employment Tribunal. Although the agency records, uh, records and publishes statistical information on both services, the collated information is not disaggregated in such a way as to identify instances in which temporary workers have availed of their respective services. The Agency Workers Regulations Northern Ireland 2011 are due to come into operation on 5 December and will provide additional protections for temporary agency workers. It is not anticipated that the, the LRA will receive any complaints in relation to this legislation until some time after it has come into operation. For supplementary. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the, the member for his answer, but I am somewhat disappointed that the information asked is not readily available. The Minister will agree that temporary workers have been treated shamefully, not just by the private sector, but by the public sector. Can he outline the extent of sanctions that are now available uh, to people who find themselves with no workers' rights at all? Uh, well, I think um, the, the problems identified by Mr. Dallas perhaps give some of the context as to why we recently have um, put in place the agency workers' um, uh, regulations and why we have transposed that European directive uh, into Northern Ireland. And it is to give um, the agency workers uh, that type um, of protection in the workplace, uh, where in effect they are treated um, on a par with existing em employees. What we have sought to do, however, in Northern Ireland is to, to, to find an appropriate balance uh, between the, the rights of agency workers and also the needs of, of business. Uh, and that's why we follow suit with, with the practice in terms of the rest of the United Kingdom in having the initial 12-week derogation uh, before the terms of that directive apply. But I think that this uh, way forward is a major win, both for business and indeed the agency workers, and uh, will go a long way to addressing uh, the type of concerns that Mr Dallet has outlined. Any members they need to continually rise in their place. I mean, there are some members, and they have a great difficulty. As soon as the minister sits down, the members should be on their feet. And if we all do that, we'll all get there. I thank the minister for his questions today. Can I ask the minister what steps his department is taking to ensure better working environment and harmonisation between employees, employers, and heads of colleges? And would the minister acknowledge that there is difficulties? Um, uh, first of all, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, rise and, and sit down a bit slower, give the <laughs> members a bit, a bit more of a chance. Um, I, I suspect that the members may be referring to a particular uh, instance, but I'm going to maybe refer to the, to the generality and, and say that uh, I, th I think it is something that we all need to be, to be mindful of, whether it's the public sector or indeed the, the private sector. I don't think um, anyone gains from disputes or lack of, hormone, of, of harmony in, in the workplace, and, and where employers and employees are all working in one direction, I think um, we all stand to benefit um, from that. And certainly, I'm more than happy uh, for my department to provide leadership in that regard. And indeed, the Labour Relations Agency uh, stands ready to assist businesses uh, with particular advice um, to, to provide uh, improvements in, in, in the workplace and to ensure that we avoid a situation where disputes actually arise in the first place. Because whenever we, we end up with disputes, it's, it's more costly uh, to, to the economy and indeed the businesses affected. Michael Copeland for some matter. Mr. Copeland. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I too congratulate the Minister on the opaqueness of his answer thus far. Um, could I ask the Minister, does he accept that even though uh, labour flexibility is without doubt an essential component of a, mar of a modern market led uh, 
manufacturing economy, it is still essential that the legislation protects all workers. Um, very much so, and uh, I, I am f fully committed uh, to a growing dynamic economy and appreciate the importance um, of, of, of labour uh, f flexibility. Um, equally, I'm important, I, I do support the equal treatment uh, of workers, and I think it's, um, that's why we, we, we struck the particular balance we did with the agency workers' um, regulations uh, in terms of respecting uh, that need for some flexibility uh, in terms of, of the, the, the labour market, while at the same time extending uh, rights to, to temporary workers, uh, that, that full-time uh, workers, um, or shall we say permanent workers, uh, also enjoy. Ian McRae, next on the list. Mr McRae. Thank you, Deputy S or Mr Speaker. Question number six. The Northern Regional College has submitted a preliminary business case to my department which makes recommendations at a strategic level in relation to accommodation needs across its range of campuses. The business case is a high-level view and will be followed by a more in-depth examination of these needs. The preliminary business case recommends that the Macrofell campus will continue to be a delivery point for Northern Regional Colleges for other education programmes. Paper supplementary. Mr. Uh, I welcome the, the Minister's confirmation, um, though with the event earlier up um, in the Long Gallery, I um, took the opportunity to speak to some of the people from, from the Northern Regional College. But will the Minister, um, obviously there has been some concern that the Antrim, with the Antrim campus closing that some of the others were, were under um, threat, but I'm glad that he has confirmed that. But will the Minister um, agree to ensure that whatever um, different training is available, um, that the people of Mid-Ulster, um, certainly the Macrofell side of, of the constituency, will be able to avail of as many um, as possible in respect of the training needs and ensure that the, the training needs are fully met. Um, I thank Mr McRae uh, for, for a supplementary. Indeed, Northern Regional College is getting a, a very good outing. Um, today, I think it's important that we that we stress that um, the, the individual campuses uh, of the different um, colleges acro across Northern Ireland um, will provide both a, a general range of services, but also will, will tend to, to specialise uh, in certain courses uh, and, uh, as well. And I certainly look forward to a situation where we have a, a, free, a free exchange of, of people. And indeed, Macrofelt shouldn't be seen as just servicing the, the local community Macrofelt or indeed Mid Ulster, uh, but as part of the, the wider uh, network, network in terms of, of the Northern Regional College itself. Uh, and in the same way that, as it attracts people from other parts um, of, of the catchment area, people from Macrofelt may well go to other campuses. Uh, to avail um, of opportunities there. Um, it's important as well to stress that while um, th this far um, all seems fine for Macrofelt, um, we are still awaiting the, the, the full outline business case uh, from the, the Northern Regional College. And certainly, um, I, I, I see that Mr. McRae is, is, is encouraged, and I, I don't want to um, dissuade him of that in, in, in any way. But um, that will come forward in, in, in due course, and um, one would hope that the, the, uh, that will, will be reflected in its, 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 its uh, future recommendations. Brand for supplementary. Thank you very much, and I'm glad I'm getting in before the time's up there. Thank the Minister for his answer so far. I have met and seen firsthand a local secondary level students who are working towards GCSE qualifications within the Markerfeld campus um, on vocational subjects such as bricklaying, joinery, hairdressing and beauty. Can the Minister outline what plans he has, if any, to further enhance, develop and fund uh, links with the Department of Education and specifically local secondary level schools in that area? Um, I, I can't comment on, on the, the very specifics of the, the, the nature of the, the learning communities that are emerging in the Middle Ulster area, but certainly um, there is a commitment uh, from uh, my department uh, to the entitlement framework where um, further education will work in conjunction uh, with the, the, the secondary system. And again, um, just to stress that we are um, hoping to broaden that out in the very near future uh, to the beginnings of the, the 14 to 19 strategy um, for Northern Ireland, uh, which will see joint working uh, between the two departments um, on, a, on a broader range of issues of affecting uh, that cohort of, of young people. Mr. Barton. Is the Minister aware of the PwC report into employment practices at the North West College and does he have a view about the seriousness of the matters therein? 
as, as the speakers want to say, that, I think that question is, is grown with significant legs. Um, I, I'm certainly uh, aware of the issues that uh, Mr Byrne um, re refers to, and um, the PwC have, who are the internal auditors of North West Regional College, um, have commissioned a report. And, uh, that is, I think, currently in, in draft form, and um, in, in, we look forward to, to looking at the, the, the conclusions of that in, in the very near future and, and to see uh, what the way forward will, will be. Um, but I, I'm certainly aware of the, the, uh, the issues that have been raised, uh, both by the member and other uh, members from the wider Northwest um, uh, political family. For members, that ends question time. We will now return to the debate on forensics.